had you Back to one more, not like we used to I miss every minute we've been through From the hardest part to the best you Make the stars lie, words cannot describe To me no more goodbyes, you leave me hypnotized Make the stars lie, I need you here tonight To me no more Hi, how are you? How have you been? Enjoying the nice weekend weather uh, out there. Uh, myself, speaking of myself, uh, <coughs> I've been struggling with this, uh, fixing these technical problems. Over, yeah, it's, in, it's been taking much longer than I have expected. So now I have solved, so uh, re reshooting this whole uh, thing. So anyway, uh, let's get <coughs> started. So in a continuation of the previous uh, lecture, which is about the origin, now we moved into the biological evolution, uh, also known as Darwinism. So we discussed in the previous lecture, the, toward the end of the previous lecture, we uh, discussed uh, one particular uh, event of the mass extinction which happened the uh, the, <clears throat> the last time uh like such events of a mass extinction uh was not the only uh incidents but several uh incidents of the mass extinction have occurred and like i said the uh, the uh, reason why i brought up uh that event was uh not because I am kind of uh, <coughs> enjoying those uh, huge disaster uh, things, anything like that. But uh, anytime we experience uh, all those life forms on Earth, experience the mass extinction event, then uh, follows the new opportunity of uh, the new diversification in the form of speciation. The particular procedure is called adaptive radiation and it defines as uh, rapid changes and actually the huge diversification of species. So you get to see in a, a relatively very short period of the time, you get to witness that huge e explosion of uh, new forms of lives new sp in, in the form of new species and then when they <clears throat> emerge as a new uh, newbies and then each of these new forms of life um, as a new species uh, then they adapt to their own specific uh, environment uh, in the form of some their way of adaptation we recognize as this ecological uh, niches. Okay. So, uh, so uh, with no exception, when we experience the last time that uh, mass extinction of the, mostly that the big reptiles, uh, also known as this the dinosaur and now uh, when they are gone now uh, it became a new opportunity for us mammals including humans and all other the more familiar animals and also uh, speaking about plants these flowering plants are relatively uh, newly evolved uh, ones so, so this, uh, the, after the mass of the, uh, after the mass extinction of this oldest dinosaur, which was a horrible, unfortunate uh, event, obviously, to them, and uh, with them, uh, perhaps like almost 80% uh, of, even more than, 80% of all life forms existing that exist on uh, Earth at the time also died out. But 
the minority of those who were able to survive to them now after a, uh, a few years of i don't know actually actually uh, how exactly how long uh, time must have actually passed until these new opportunities is opened up to these mammals and the flowering plants and all other uh, newly evolved uh, life forms but anyway then they begin to prosper on, on lands as well as uh, in the water too so uh, this <coughs> table uh, and combination of all uh, so to illustrate what are those representative of the major life forms of uh, in different geological uh, timetable or geological period or which is starting from the earlier to late uh, in the history of Earth. So here approximately this uh, era like uh, as I mentioned in the previous lecture like uh, Cretaceous and uh, Paleogene the at the borderline between these two periods so that's why we call it as a KT or a KPG uh, extinction mass extinction because it occurred at the, around the, the boundary of these two distinct uh, geological period so before uh, all those earths was taken by and dominated by these big reptiles and other uh, that gigantic animals uh, and if you think about it actually the the time uh, period which was dominated by this dinosaur as their major life form in land was something like uh, about 250 something uh, million years can you think uh, can you imagine that how long would that be yeah, 250 million years uh, about that so this so other mammals and uh, including humans uh, they only begin to uh, appear on earth very recently and their actual uh, relative uh, history of uh, uh, existence was uh, relatively speaking, extremely short uh, so as you can also check on this table uh, not only this, the most recent uh, mass extinction event, which wiped out almost 80% of the old life forms uh, on Earth, but there were also, like at this Triassic and Jurassic uh, in between uh, those uh, periods, there was also another major uh, the mass extinction the record of mass extinction, then perhaps that event also must have uh, involved some such a new opportunities for the previously like uh, minority form of life once all those majority of these life forms are extinct and gone. Uh, and so actually this Permian uh, mass extinction was uh was said to be the largest the most devastating event of such so that oh almost 100 percent 95 percent of all life forms uh were killed uh by this mass extinction so you can so this uh I'm not saying that these five events were the only extinction event. There also, uh, there were so many other smaller scale extinctions have been recorded on the history of this whole uh, life on Earth in the form of mainly the fossil records and or uh, and and uh, other ways of other means of the evidence. So the point here is, like, once the majority form of major form of life uh, are eliminated, eliminated uh, due to the extinction event, then uh, new opportunities are visit to the once minority form of life, and then uh, life goes on, and then generating. Uh, 
uh, the new variety of life forms in the form of new speciation. So speaking of these mammals, um, mammals, by the way, uh, hopefully every one of uh, you are familiar with the, the, the definition of mammals. Mammals are the animals that uh, all have in common is the breast uh, breast feeding uh, mode of the behavior in raising their youngs, uh, the babies. So this uh, imaginary uh, painting, drawing of the ancestral form of the mammals, like uh, which is believed to have lived in about 260 million years ago, uh, like this. So it was the first form of, of course, we can uh, infer this type of information from uh, all kinds of fossil records, obviously. And so uh, from that, uh, all the descendants of this, the first form of a so-called common ancestral form of all the mammals. So here, uh, so on this geological time scale, here uh, is the timing when that the, the last mass extinction occurred, which uh, eliminated all this dinosaur. And as you can see, uh, especially all these different mammals, uh, there are actually three different kinds of mammals. Once they uh, began, it's uh, all just a single form, obviously the ancestral mammals uh, shown in the previous slide. And then they began to diverge over a long period of time like this and then what you can uh, observe over here is after this the mass extinction event and now you have this big radiation of this depths uh, the widening of this uh, the blue line indicates the radiation radiative uh, event of diversification of all kind of a difference new uh, forms of uh, uh, all this particular form of life uh, so these three types all <coughs> are the members of the big group of uh, what we recognize as mammals then three different forms and these uh, so-called uh, placental mammals uh, are the one that uh, we are more familiar with uh, all kind of and also uh, more diverse in kinds, as you can see over here, more than 5,000 species, actually, uh, the members of this so-called eutherians, uh, placental members, okay. uh, that having the placenta. But also, uh, you notice that there are uh, slightly different types of uh, animals, mammals, although they are also mammals, especially if you go to those uh, area of uh, the o Oceanian, like uh, Australia, a lot of uh, kangaroo and the koalas and <coughs> so on. opossums are also, and then they are called the marsupials. Uh, the common feature of all these, uh, the mammals grouped together as uh, marsupials uh, is that uh, their youngs are like immature. They just uh, have a the immature babies and then so they uh, have some of the the mature uh, period with the uh, the mom's care uh, so physically closely attached it's just like uh, you can see in the case of this kangaroo and this uh, monotremes on the other hand is a, a little bit of the minority form of the mammals and the uh, interesting thing about these monotremes, uh, one major representative of this uh, monotreme is a uh, platypus. Uh, and it is a mammal, but uh, uh, they lay an egg is their distinctive feature of that. So by the way, these monotremes uh, in Korean, somebody actually specifically asked the, uh, as much as possible to put some Korean version of this term, the is 
a representative of this monotrim and in Korean name is this and which is this okay uh, so so this adaptive radiation the steps the usual steps uh, by which this adaptive radiation proceed is uh, this first the big environmental change usually in the form of uh, like a mass extinctions like that okay so it disrupt it gives a, a huge huge change it's a big disruption in this existing community now then when they are all wiped out so this place become vacant and this vacant habitat is now colonized occupied by new population the survivors or some other occasions like if those uh, catastrophic uh, event was uh, some kind of local not the global scale like a mass extinction or such that uh, like uh, that wiped out all the dinosaurs and um, more than 80% of the uh, anim uh, animal and plants on, on earth uh, but those the disaster can occur in a, a local scale and then some other animals outside the uh, outside region of this local uh, area can now uh, come to this area which is vacant so migration is another way of this occupying uh, occupying the new vacant habitat so for these animals newcomers there was no interference okay at first so they have actually uh, they can have a very rapid period of huge diversification of this differentiation into uh, multi-species okay because there is no uh, like a limitation uh, uh, virtually speaking uh, but as we know all these things has to uh, be done in a compliance with that particular certain environmental conditions so everybody is so busy in uh, in making their ad adaptation on their own like a very unique way of adaptation creatively uh, and so to speak but uh, they have to be aware of like, uh, like adjusting to the new specific environment condition so that we usually describe in this way of adaptations into new niches so we have to define what's niches okay uh, so uh, let me finish this uh, procedure steps of adaptive radiation um, so this adaptive radiation is uh, one of the major trend in the present revolution usually when evolution occurs they usually have this form of these steps they go through this step of so-called adaptive radiation although uh, i'm not saying that uh, all those every different uh, the occasion of evolution has to go through this adaptation uh, adaptive radiation no it doesn't really have to but usually yeah this adaptive radiation is a well, just a major trend in the evolution the process of evolution and that the famous uh, Darwin's finches that I'm going to uh, introduce shortly uh, what they are if you are not uh, <clears throat> familiar with this the story of Darwin's finches actually that is the one that inspired uh, like a decisively inspired uh, the Darwin's to formulate uh, come up with his uh, original idea of this uh, evolution uh, by the natural selection so this Darwin's finches all those uh, birds uh, finch birds lived on particular islands the Galapagos Islands uh, on the South America uh, 
They were actually uh, our descendants of one uh, ancestral form of the bird uh, originally migrated from the mainland South America, which is actually happens to be in an Ecuador, uh, like about relatively very recently, because those Galapagos Islands are the, uh, the, the result of a volcanic eruption uh, that uh, were formed relatively very uh, newly formed islands. So before there were no life forms uh, exists there. So then once uh, on single ancest ancestral form of the bird migrated into several different islands because Galapagos Island is many many different uh, islands just like the Philippines and Indonesia. So uh, then this bird, originally one form, single form, uh, has differentiated into 14 new different forms nowadays, each of which is recognized as actual new species. Okay? Uh, and these 14 new different species uh, got to occupy four distinct ecological niches. So it's just uh, ecological niches been referred more than once. So perhaps we better define, we, we better find out what uh, that is. So like, uh, hold on a minute. So uh, let me just uh, finish this Galapagos Island story and then we will get to that uh, right on to. So this is the map of this is where this Galapagos Island uh, is located. So it is not that far from the mainland Ecuador. So the <clears throat> what we uh, believe is one migratory uh, ancestor bird flew uh, over to this Galapagos Island at, uh, at first. And so this is the uh, <clears throat> enlarged uh, map of this uh, several islands on this Galapagos Island. Now, this is some of the, uh, actually, 13 of 14 different uh, birds. Uh, one, uh, the finch bird is not shown over here, but uh, all um, almost all others were shown. And as you can notice, so here, this was the original ancestral form of the bird. Then it, uh, so to speak, radiated into or differentiated into all these different. You notice the differences just by looking at the uh, head area of this bird. Uh, in particular, the uh, <coughs> the beak or bill, uh, whatever you just uh, recognize. So this. Uh, big area depending on the particular habitats environment they have adapted into have a different size and a different functionality of their like uh, this beak uh, or in other words it's a bill and so once again what we actually have to recognize this is the reason why, uh, through relatively very short periods of time, the reason why this ancestral one single form of the bird can uh, be differentiated into several different forms of this uh, different types of birds, all of which are now are like independent, separate uh, species, is that the variation. Uh, Just like the case of when we were trying to explain uh, the way the giraffe has uh, got to obtain their long neck uh, from their earlier form of the shorter neck, uh, the ancestral giraffe. In the population, there must have been some genetic variation existed. Okay. So in a potentially the hidden uh, the trait. Now uh, in under each different circumstances of the environment, each different trait has been favored uh, by the, this particular uh, environment. So it's 
once again example of natural selection so those who carry that particular trait uh, were able to do better so that they were able to uh, produce more number of offspring or in some more harsh cases like it, uh, it, it made their life and death differences uh, so that's how end up in a short period of time there are several different variety of the birds or like each of which occupying predominantly occupying in different uh, environments okay so like in here uh, some of them are uh, like the vegetarians okay. uh, the, uh, they eat specifically bird uh, plant bud uh, and so the bill uh, is specifically the physically uh, adapted into like uh, manipulating such tough plant uh, bud and uh, some of them are also they are the vegetarians and the seed uh, eaters having their own respective different uh, morphological feature in particular in their uh, bill area and on the other hand some others are the meat eaters like insect eaters so then they have their respective uh, different shapes and functionality of this the bill and the one uh, finch bird which was not shown was a vegetarian but is a cactus uh, finch uh, which is very interesting in that uh, we don't really get to see uh, many too many of birds who feed on the cactus plant perhaps that particular uh, environment of the Galapagos Island, uh, the only available, mainly available food source must have been this uh, cactus plants. So all of them have to uh, <coughs> adapt their own life uh, styles like that. Uh, so let's take a uh, like uh, look at this. Perhaps no animal group has contributed more to the history of evolutionary biology than the Galapagos finches also called Darwin's finches. The birds bear the name of Darwin because they, more than any other living thing, supplied the evidence of evolution. Similar in size and coloration, the 14 species differ from each other mainly in beak structure and feeding habits. From a single ancestral lineage of seed-eating finches, the Galapagos finches underwent adaptive radiation and evolved a variety of species capable of exploiting diverse ecological niches. The varied shapes of their bills are related to the different ways in which the Galapagos finches obtain their food. Some species feed mainly on seeds. There are species that feed on flowers and buds, and some that snack on cactus and its seeds. But most of Darwin's finches feed on insects. The warbler finch, with its slender and pointed bill, feeds almost exclusively on insects. In fact, the medium ground finch adds protein to its cellulose-rich seed diet by grooming ticks from iguanas and tortoises. Okay, uh, so that's... <laughs> the uh, very neat more short movie about this Darwin's finches now it's time to as I promised that now it's time to uh, look at and uh, learn about uh, what's ecological niche uh, first of uh, I pronounce this as a niche okay? and as you have heard hopefully in the film uh, that you have just watched the the uh, narrator uh, pronounced it as a niche so I just uh, mispronounced. Uh, no, it's not actually. Both of them uh, are regarded as a correct form of a pronunciation. But uh, in these days, uh, it appears that uh, the niche pronunciation of the niche uh, looks like it's gaining uh, more popularity. But when I first, when I in um, undergraduate, when in my undergraduate uh, back in those in the United States a uh, long time ago when I first learned this term the niche I actually 
uh, pronounce this as niche, uh, like uh, from uh, my own like instinct. Like it sounds like I should. I felt it. I should pronounce as niche. But then my advisor, who was a really nice gentleman from uh, yeah, Scotland, he was uh, the, the PhD of uh, that uh, renowned Edinburgh University. I really actually had a, at first a hard time to understand his uh, speaking because he has a, such a distinct Scottish accent. Uh, I had to meet him and have this discussion weekly discussion after I write the weekly term papers and turn it in to him. That's how I actually uh, went through the, my undergrad education. Uh, it was it was really tough, but it was really uh, useful and uh, I had a lot of uh, the fond memories with it. But anyway, he, in the classroom, uh, I just uh, pronounced this in, in during the discussion, pronounced this niche, niche. And then, uh, obviously, that must have irritated him. Um, during the break, he approached me and then asked me, Mr. Kim. Uh, he always uh, called me by Mr. Kim, even though I'm just a small, mere uh, undergrad student. Just uh, the way, uh, like, that's the way of those British and the Scottish. And then he also gets very angry whenever I just refer him, like, uh, regard him as uh, one of those uh, English or the British. No, he, he was so upset. I'm a Scottish. Yeah. But anyway, uh, he... Uh, he asked me, Mr. Kim, do you speak French? Uh, and of course, obviously, no. Uh, I just uh, had a, such a not a pleasant memory of a French because I took the French course in my college days back in Korea and then I got flunked. Uh, so no, uh, I responded and no. And, and then uh, he, uh, he was like, well, then uh, you actually would have been a much uh, more excellent speaker in French if you learn the French. What do you mean by that? Uh, like this niche uh, is a French way of a pronunciation is niche, but usually those uh, who speak English usually pronounce as a niche. Uh, okay, that's how I learned and then kind of uh, <clears throat> imprinted in my uh, brain. So ever since I always uh, like I don't forget. I never forget pronouncing this as a niche. But then here and there, I uh, heard that this particular word is being pronounced as a niche. So then, oh, was I wrong? So I looked it up. And then no, uh, I wasn't. So both niche, niche or niche are the correct form of pronunciations. Okay. So aside uh, from that pre uh, trivia, so this uh, ecological niche means. Uh, kind of a relative role uh, of a given species and try in trying to survive and, and adjust, adapt to a specific environmental habitat. Maybe it sounds like a little bit of a vague uh, like definition. It's kind of a, a territorial activity. So it is not a territory, but some kind of activity, but under on the specific territory, which is being played by a specific form of lives in the given habitat. So even in the same local habitat, different form of lives will display different ecological niche uh, is probably uh, one uh, simpler way of uh, explanation for this niche. Uh, original actually term the niche came from this so a small uh, recess the area where you can store some of your artifacts including your painting and some other the items uh, so in outside of uh, external of the buildings uh, you can have many such those in western architecture you usually have you can see many such niches so then here in biology, this uh, niche is utilized and is borrowed to, uh, to illustrate such uh, the role, different role uh, that is played by different form of life in a given environment. So 
uh, on a given ecological niche can include uh, what they eat as a, a specific form of uh, life uh, adjusted to that environment and how they interact with others is also another example of such ecological niche and where do they live is also obviously so several different such behavioral things uh, can be included in this uh, the niche description okay so why this niche like this is different role playing so to speak in a given environment why why do they have to uh, differentiate as so, a you know those occupants of a particular environment habitat why do they have to usually why do they you always show a certain kind of a differentiation to have a different niche why because by doing so they can dramatically reduce this so-called this competition competition is always a really big problem for uh, any uh, resident in a given environment uh, nobody wants to actually have a severe, uh, fierce competition. And uh, probably the same thing is true for in your case. Uh, so, so once they have this different, differentiating to have different niches, then they can reduce this competition so that everybody, <coughs> almost, almost everybody can be uh, happy or at least they can reduce the stress coming from such uh, severe competition. Okay, so here is one cartoonic version of such niche explanation. So in a, a single tree, uh, for example, can be divided up uh, into three different niches. You you can see this as a, such as three different territories, but niches are a little different than uh, mere uh, geographical territory divisions. So here up some specific birds uh, like take as their own territory and then uh, leave their own particular way of lives and in the middle different type of a bird uh, at the bottom a different type of such occupant even though entirely this tree uh, is providing the life uh, for the birds but they don't really mingle uh, and uh, so and they have a specific this role division uh, just like we have seen in this uh, example so this niche is one importance uh, the factor of this niche is now through this you can have such thing like a resource partitioning uh, so that's one of the reason why you are doing this so in order to reduce this competition how what how can you reduce competition in this niche role play this is an example like so even in this beach area several different type of birds can have different uh, the resource partitioning so when they uh, have this feeding uh, activity they will have their own different territories so that different forms of uh, uh, the uh, uh, praise uh, can be uh, captured by different uh, types of birds so that in this way they can uh, greatly significantly reduce the tension of competition okay so uh, one such uh, niche playing uh, can be seen in the Australia and also New Zealand, in particular in New Zealand, where no mammals actually like they don't have any uh, real mammals. Okay, even in Australia they do have this the kangaroo like type of mammals, right? Those marsupials are there. However, in New Zealand there were no uh, mammals because the breakaway of the New Zealand this land broke uh, apart. Uh, very recently relatively speaking so uh, I mean yeah the recently but also uh, when they uh, broke away from the main area of the land actually they didn't have any chance to uh, allow the, the migration of the mammals into this particular area so uh, no uh, endemic uh, mammals live there so then Instead of those mammals, the birds 
are playing the roles of uh, otherwise in other area of the land in some other areas like those roles would have been played by the mammals but now since there is no mammals then different birds are actually taking that such a role so this uh, this different niche utilization uh, can be taken as an such example uh, so one uh, such thing is this particular marvelous bird or unfortunately they are now all extinct this more bird uh, uh, it is said that this more bird used to live even something like 1600 or uh, anything like that but then afterwards uh, man-made uh, uh, excessive hunting uh, eliminated all this more bird on um, this New Zealand uh, island so this more bird uh, there when they were there lived uh, it acted like as if uh, this deers would do in other area of uh, on earth and uh, and another example, this this uh, famous uh, kiwi bird in New Zealand uh, is actually uh, taking the role of uh, the badgers. Uh, when these badgers are really nasty animals, but uh, then still they just uh, the grazing uh, on the grassland and then and capturing the insects and the small uh, the prey like that. And kiwi birds are doing uh, such a thing on New Zealand. And finally, this another very uh, famous endemic bird of New Zealand, uh, rock wren, uh, is actually taking the role similar to those the mice uh, do on other area of uh, the land. And this uh, insect metamorphosis is another example of such naturalization here. Uh, in the single individual is the yeah, differentiating into uh, like uh, their roles into different uh, forms of life through this particular change in their uh, body form uh, through metamorphosis so that they can uh, severely reduce over time so then they don't have to different form of like a larva and pupa and adult uh, even though they are all the part of one single same individual but when it is the uh, when it was a larva stage they actually feed on some specific uh, food and in when it becomes uh, the pupa then they totally different they utilize to totally different uh, resource and so is the same thing is true for when it finally became an adult form is uh, such a good example of such niche utilization okay so that's about this uh, the speciation through adaptive radiation now then we can take a look at it's time to take a, a more detailed look of this uh, speciation First, see, this speciation is the uh, tool by which that uh, I shouldn't say it's a tool, but speciation is a something that through which this so-called evolution is accomplished. Okay. So when you witness the emergence of a new species, now you call, okay, I have, an evolution has occurred, right. So that's the usual way of you uh, like uh, recognize the evolution when new species form from old one like from common ancestor you have you have this uh, split of whole new two different species obviously that's an evolution now but usually people distinguish this event of evolution as smaller scale of evolution as a micro evolution and the larger scale of evolution is a macro evolution like that okay so first let's uh, let's define uh, how they are different micro versus macro uh, evolution so here this is uh, something that describes the macro evolution 
as you can see in the event of a macro evolution starting from a uh, one common ancestral form now you have a two big group splitting over time so this is the time always the time so if enough time was given then this will continue on uh, so at each interval you have this specific common ancestor from which uh, different forms of this. now all these are what the new species so obviously through macro evolution the process of macro evolution which actually entails the splitting from a uh, common ancestor now you have the evolution that's what we call the macro evolution however in some occasions uh, we recognize that we recognize this micro evolution here it is only within a population now this is a within Uh, same population what you see is this diversity because uh, we don't really want to get into the, uh, the, the little unnecessary details but so-called something called the gene frequency actually it is not gene but allele What's allele we will get to define this allele later uh, the, in different chapters but it's so called allele frequency is different and it changes so as a consequence like individual showing some different traits as you can recognize there are different colors over here like different combination of the, the genes uh, so you may actually be able to notice some slight differences among different individual uh, so like over generation as you go through many many rounds of this uh, generation after generation you witness some changes shifts or uh, in some occasions actually uh, initially there were many many different forms of such traits uh, in the form of like appearance but then uh, one single majority form actually predominate a uh, type of thing you a lot of times you actually uh, get to witness so first stop the microevolution is defined as a, like it is a result of a, a adaptation of an individual within a population like i said it is something event that occurring in the population so each different individual will try to adapt so uh, obviously natural selection will uh, <coughs> play its role to sort out some of the who are more fitted uh, support and those who are less fitted and like sort them out uh, so the frequency of some, some specific combination of this uh, gene uh, like portrayed as uh, some trait from outside or to to the outside observers uh, will change okay. so that's what we <laughs> call as a microevolution so this microevolutions you can actually uh, observe frequently in nature as well as even in the laboratory okay so actually this the virus the coronavirus has several different forms of the virus like uh, pain in our uh, butt and not only those coronavirus but the ace virus and all kind of them influenza virus all different always they just keep changing but still they are no matter what uh, uh, no matter how they change still they are <coughs> that virus like coronavirus or ace virus or the influenza virus that is uh, like perfectly good example of such microevolution so 
can be both observed in the laboratory as well as in nature because it occurs in a very short period of time and uh, like we recognize hopefully mutation will always occur especially the reason why you get to see so more frequently uh, the, those micro evolution in the virus because the virus has a much higher tendency of this degenerating mutation so we can very quickly uh, witness such event occurring but even not for viruses but some other like real life forms so can we uh, in many occasions actually easily find those event occurring uh, on the other hand is macro evolution is the something that we recognize as the speciation so through macro evol evolution a new species <coughs> arose and so uh, it's more professionally you can define as like uh, it is an origin of the division of the uh, taxonomy what's taxonomy hierarchy uh, something the grouping some kind of a grouping of so usually I actually uh, wanted to put a more of uh, the jargon to complete this sentence but uh, I refrain myself not to uh, because it's just meaningless uh, to those poor solo, especially the Mukwa student. And uh, this taxonomic hierarchy, uh, like we will get to that uh, a little more detail uh, later on in here in <coughs> this lecture. Like we have such grouping system in organized in the form of a hierarchy. So when we have a species, several related species were grouped together in. A higher group we call it as a genus okay? and <clears throat> so on so that we have on top of the, so many uh, related genus that we have uh, some other categories like such hierarchy we are talking about yeah so in uh, as a consequence of this macro evolution not only this species uh, the new species arose but we also have this the change in the uh, and the, the organization of the uh, uh, this <coughs> structure, the hierarchy above the beyond the level of the species is what this sentence uh, originally meant. So it actually obviously I, I needed to add a little more uh, vocabulary to uh, complete uh, this sentence, but uh, what the, just something that changing. A little more than mere species level is what this macro evolution means uh, but more importantly if you understand macro evolution is something that uh, create or generate a new species it's just uh, good enough for anybody to understand and then and then more importantly being able to distinguish the difference between macro evolution and the micro evolution because uh, through microevolution, you are not there yet. Maybe, maybe if you continue on this microevolution proce uh, procedure, then uh, ultimately you may be able to reach uh, the like a, at the level of creating new species. And actually, uh, several occasions that you have actually seen, and uh, you can also speculate. I mean, how do you think actually all these different species on the Galapagos Island arose starting from single? So initially they must have gone through the microevolution procedure and then after a long period of time then each different, uh, different traits of individual carrying the different distinct trait now like became fixed as a new species and that's how they all the different 14 different finch species were generated so like microevolution once again uh, to reiterate microevolution can be said of like in the the intermediate step towards the speciation yes uh so but this macroevolution, on the other hand, uh, cannot actually be witnessed 
nobody nobody actually have seen the completion of the macro evolution in their lifetime because it takes such a long period of time uh, but we can you can only guess okay uh, educated guess okay that's must that probably must have uh, come to this particular uh, result starting from uh, such and such thing actually the da Charles Darwin himself uh, have this particular speculation of through which the modern day elephants uh, were generated through this speciation macro evolutionary uh, event starting from one of the ancestral form of such uh, ancient animal like along which this the famous uh, mastodon of the ancient the elephant like uh, organism and also this uh, more recent is a mammoth uh, but so all these were the ancestral form of uh, like, uh, uh, these elephants both of them african and asian elephant and sharing the common ancestor at some point like this is his original like uh, brainstorming of uh, trying to illustrate how these uh, elephants were evolved through this process of so-called um, macro evolution right so that's the difference between micro and macro evolution and the point here is uh, unfortunately in many times more than uh, not uh some people even they are this biologist i actually my some of my colleagues are saying because they were such a faithful devoted christian they say i do believe uh well i can uh, reckon that the microevolution is a true things yes that's something that happened but I don't believe that macroevolution is a real thing. Oh, what a just illogical way of... If you actually truly understand what's in it in the course of the microevolution, how can you not then believe the macroevolution? Because it is something that well uh, c connected without any... Uh, it's a, so fluidly connected one, so to speak. So, you cannot really recognize one thing and deny the other. This is all well connected things. It's just a matter of the only difference is a time. If you give enough time to the microevolution, then eventually it will become a macroevolution. The only problem is that you didn't get to see actually what's the macroevolution happening because you cannot live long enough to follow that. So that's very sad and uh, I just wonder where is your logic uh, and if you don't have any such logic how can you uh, practice uh, the job of so called the science whatever it is uh, whether it is a uh, biology or physics or chemistry it's all about the art of uh, science is an art of logic so well uh, so let's uh, take a look at this as a species under the definition yeah, it is the smallest unit of organism groups in taxonomy classification. Because uh, one, in, in some way or earlier, this so-called what is taxonomic hierarchy was referred. So this, uh, we have to first define what's a taxonomy. So taxonomy is something like uh, the, the grouping job. So this taxonomy uh, is a a kind of a branch of a biological uh, branch, branch uh, that uh, what they do in taxonomy is try to group or classify just like you try to group all different books in the library for your convenience okay uh, so in taxonomy you try to classify group all the living and or also even the ones lived now extinct uh, organisms too uh, so you cannot really group them arbitrarily so you have to have a certain type of rule 
example, obviously. So that's how you do this taxonomy as a, a, a type of a science, right? Um, so in other words, in taxonomy itself, does not really have to worry about the actual the evolutionary origin of different organisms. Just because you group certain organisms together in a one group doesn't mean they are evolutionarily also related ones. Uh, you don't have any such uh, the obligation. Uh, however, uh, however, sometimes actually, and if you try to do this uh, very good job of this uh, the work of taxonomy, and there is no, no point, I mean, you cannot avoid, uh, but to group them according to their respective evolutionary relationship, you get to. Uh, so, the, actually, if you are concerned of this uh, evolutionary relationship, then you have to study this. Which is very similar appear in appearance. Very, uh, it looks very similar to taxonomy. However, it is totally different things because the starting point is different. Uh, here, this phylogeny uh, is something that uh, is uh, about, which is about the evolutionary history of all different organisms. So, this the study of phylogenetics as a, a kind of science. It is study of phylogeny, right? Uh, and usually the way you express, display the, uh, the, their relationship is using so-called phylogenetic tree, this type of a tree, complex tree diagram, uh, and each base, uh, at the base of this tree, uh, occupies the common ancestors, right? Uh, what, by now every one of us is kind of comfortable with uh, looking at this type of uh, the phylogenetic trees so using this we uh, try to uh, describe their relative closeness or distance uh, in, in their relationship uh, according to their evolutionary history okay. but in taxonomy like i said um, they can incorporate this information learned from phylogenetics to reflect their and then actually it is a more uh, probably in my view it is a more accurate way of uh, grouping them because uh, after all this the rule of this grouping is trying to put the similar organism together is what uh, they are trying to do in taxonomy too and what similarity what's the basis of this similarity why certain organisms are similar to each other than the others because they share their common ancestors in the more recent uh, history it's actually more logical way of uh, if you kind of accepting uh, the idea of the evolution yeah that's the only way no other way around so this is actually one way of such performing this taxonomy uh, in the branch of uh, uh, the taxonomy called the cladistics, they use this. It appears like exactly those phylogenetic tree, doesn't it? Uh, right. Uh, historically, this taxonomy was uh, founded by the renowned scientists. Actually, at the time, this uh, they were you uh, rather. Uh, called the naturalist than scientists because they were uh, really really multifunctional uh, so not only on specific area science but they were like a broadly more generally uh, like a well uh, kind of uh, involved uh, so they were you know, expert in many different areas so rather they were re recognized as a naturalist than scientists and Carlos uh, Linné, but in English speaking uh, world, uh, they were, he, he was called, usually called as Carl uh, Linnaeus, uh, and he was uh, such a famous, uh, a big figure, uh, an influential figure at the time, a Swedish uh, naturalist. And 
he actually was the one who invented this uh, scientific naming system called the binomial nomenclature system you know to group every living organism very very systematically precisely uh, actually but the motive of this classification was something very interesting because uh, Carl Linnaeus himself was uh, such a devoted Christian so he firmly believed that uh, all the creatures living creatures at the time was the result of this God's creation so as a uh, faithful servant of God his humble duty was to uh, recognize identify every living organism and then group them so that conveni conveniently so that the uh, glory of God can be uh, revealed by his work uh, it's very interesting uh, reason why he has done it uh, as a scientist uh, but anyway uh, so he just employed such hierarchical uh, category system yeah, anybody would do this reasonably if you want to classify very systematically anything, very complex thing, then this is the only way you do. So, uh, several different levels of uh, categories, like the biggest category, which is a kingdom, and the subcategory, phylum, family, class, order, genus, and species. So, species is the, the smallest unit of such uh, category. Uh, as I have mentioned several times uh, before I just got to here. So like taking examples of this uh, leopard, uh, its scientific name uh, is a panthera pardus. So there's two different, uh, like one is using among different categories, this leopard whose scientific name happens to be a panthera pardus belongs to a bigger group uh, the genus bigger group uh, of panthera uh, within which other related uh, animals like I guess the cheetahs and the panthera also cheetahs tigers and lions and cats also maybe there so all those related animals were grouped together in a bigger but this leopard uh, has its own uh, independent category of its own species. So several different species uh, grouped together form a specific genus and then several related genus form on the bigger larger group of a family and an order carnivora means the meat eaters and the mammals mammalia you know what the mammals are like we have seen already and the chorera finally Although they are not any, uh, mem some of them are not mammals, but anybody who has this uh, spine, then they were grouped in the big group of phylum Chorera. And finally, this big group of all those animals belong to this kingdom animal. Like, so that's the way of grouping this. But the thing is, how do you recognize each individual? How do you put, what kind of a tag are you going to put to each different species? instead of having one just a single name but doing so uh, he just decided to use both the name of the genus uh, this to which this particular species belong and its particular species name together so it's that's why it's called the binomial using two naming binomial nomenclature nomenclature means it's naming so using two name uh, so try to identify the naming system is what it is what it means so each organism is identified by its genus name and species name category okay so like genus species a scientific name and all this scientific name sounds weird it's because it's all made up uh, of latins just like in these days, all those, any scientific or many professional, more of this professional, mostly, communication is done in English. The time, the culture, those Western culture was based upon this Latin culture. So that's no wonder why. So 
So like here, Homo sapiens is us. Usually, uh, sometimes, many times, the genus name is shortened, abbreviated, it's like one just big single uh, capital letter, Homo, H sapiens, because uh, in most of the cases, actually, then uh, still people know what it means. So Homo sapiens. Uh, to group the Homo sapiens, the Homo, obviously, this Homo is a genus name, and sapiens is the species name of us, calling us. And in the family, the bigger, uh, we belong to a big group, uh, the family group called Hominidae, and go over and then primates, uh, like including all kind of other related chimpanzees and monkeys and uh, stuff uh, like that, uh, all belong to this big group of primates. And the class, whatever, synapse day or but it should be as also the class should be a mammal too and corera <clears throat> an animal like that what about the sea sea lupus so here's the sea uh we don't know that it should indicate the name of this genus which is a canis canis lupus which is a wolf right so the difference between a uh, human and a uh, wolf is well, obviously, we do have uh, two separate different genus, and obviously, the family uh, is different. Order, they are the carnivora, which indicates the meat eaters. We are not the meat eaters. Also, although we can eat meat, uh, but we are not belong to those exclusive meat eater groups. But both of us are actually belong to the mammals and corera and uh, <coughs> etc like that what about this chimpanzee the name the chimpanzee's genus is a surprise is a pan it's not even homo so the scientific name of chimpanzee is a pan and so in this case there are two different types of a ch chimpanzee species like this particular species of chimpanzee is a pan trolodites okay so the point here is Today, chimpanzee is the closest ever relative of us humans. We are the closest, like brothers. But even between chimpanzee and us, we don't even share the common genus. So where is the other? So in other words, we are the sole member of this genus, Homo. With the all other my brothers and sisters gone, gone. Yeah, they. Well, we are we are going to. <clears throat> handle this thing uh, at the uh, toward the end of this chapter but the all different other members of this our genus homo are all extinct but we are the only sole survivor of this genus so that's how we end up like uh, sharing this the <coughs> the most intimate relationship with this rather distantly looking the chimpanzee although yeah they in, in many many other uh, different aspects they are so closely related uh with us but still so speaking of these different species like uh number of different species living today so uh, enormous actually estimated estimated which means we haven't even been able to figure out how how many exactly are there out there only about like 10 percent of this or this been identified so like this is kind of a statement of the species diversity existing even today another thing is like this species unlike on the contrary to the strong and the common beliefs in in the past like when those like 1900 or the 1700 or 1800 and when those christianity and western culture was like predominant over there uh this species <clears throat> species changes the existing species as we have already know that like mass extinction wipe out existing majority of existing species and then new species uh afterwards uh arise and that pattern 
repeats. Okay, so extinction and new species, and as we have already seen, five major such extinction event have been already recorded during the history of an evolution like this. So, like all these asterisk uh, are such a major extinction event of uh, like we have already seen. But more importantly, many, many uh, scientists who are concerned uh, with this area, uh, this business, believe that, uh, that the, the next one, when it will come, they are not really sure when the uh, next six the sixth extinction would come uh, to visit us but they are pretty much certain that the next one will be on us we are the one who actually created generate generated this uh, the next uh, extinction due to oh so many stupidity uh, we have actually committed in in the form of uh, the destruction of the all different environment and habitats and like things okay so <clears throat> uh, a little bit more about this species uh, so <clears throat> this biological species concept uh, let's just take a look at this or should I actually take a little bit of a break I may actually have a, a little more extended uh, lecture version although I promise not to do so but depending on because I do want to definitely I do want to at least finish uh, this chapter so that next week I want to move on to the next chapter new chapter about the cells so uh, let's actually take a break at over here <coughs> and then uh, have a fresh start with this uh, biological species concept uh, even though it may take actually instead of a two session it may take a three session of the lecture uh, this week but who cares Forgive me. <laughs>